All right, so good afternoon, guys. Thanks for uh, taking some time and uh, spending it with uh, me and my ever-fading voice. So many of you know that I'm not unwilling to talk, so it may be a blessing if my voice gives up, my throat gives out here, right? Um, so what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is a little bit about intelligent mainframe and, and the evolution that we're seeing moving to expert systems and kind of how CA is playing in that. Um, Today we made, it, made an original announcement about mainframe operations intelligence, and it was really our first step into that foray of introducing an analytics engine inside of some of our technology that allows us to do some anomaly detection really in context with the, the data that we know and, and, and are pulling from our systems. So we're going to be talking about how that fits in and some of the next steps that we're looking to take from an organization perspective of some of where we're taking to hopefully be that closed loop system where the system learns from the data, learns from the user interaction, and starts to correlate and actually react to the system itself um, from an automation perspective, really moving things upstream from a mundane perspective for subject matter experts so they can actually focus. So we're going to talk about that, a little bit about what we're seeing from the market. I don't think there's any new things that you're going to learn from that. A little bit about what we see as intelligent mainframe, the use cases we're actually addressing with that. I have my colleague here, Greg Payne from Southwest Gas. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about his journey um, to that expert mainframe. He's been along with us on uh, the journey from the beginning of the year to now and, and continuing that with some things we're going to be doing with storage and stuff beyond that. Uh, and we'll have him kind of give us some ideas about how they're doing, what they're, why they're going in the direction, and some of the things they're focused on. So, you know, we all, I think, in here, um, understand the mainframe is part of the mission critical part of the economy. Uh, applications are driving the growth of the usage of mainframe. We know that. We know that 70% of all data is still in the mainframe. We know that um, avail availability is a requirement of that. We know that you know, the growth that we're seeing is not necessarily a um, growth in revenue but more in transactions of applications that are actually touching that, that mainframe. So when you get a mobile application or if you're you know, a, a financial institution and someone is making a request for some type of information, invariably there's a starburst effect of the information and how it attacks, or not how it attacks, how it interacts with the mainframe. So we look at that as we understand the mainframe being a vital part of that and the MIPS growth that is there, it is really a, the growth of the application economy that's driving that growth on the mainframe and the usage of that mainframe. When an application initiates that transaction, we're seeing sometimes up to 15-fold transactions from a single request from an application. There's some that are greater, that greater than that. We have some that are less than that. But the interaction and the requests from 1,500 people on a daily basis checking their um, banking information is touching that mainframe and causing a lot of work to be actually done on that mainframe. How do we react to that? It's growing, it's we're having less people work on it, we want to be more efficient. Did you lose, you looking for something? Yeah, I'm not Hmm. Yeah, there's a bag sitting right underneath there next to John's leg. There you go. Glad we could be of help. John was keeping an eye on it for you. Um, but we see that growth. We know the mission criticalness of it. And we really need to understand how we can actually become more efficient in managing that environment. Will, come on in. How you doing? No problem. So really getting to that lean mainframe, really getting to hopefully what we call mainframe as a service eventually, are four tenets that we're actually focused on from a strategy perspective of where we want to take the environment and where we know you guys are headed. Based on everything we've been doing over the last 12 months, interactions uh, with you, I've been on site with some of you guys, been in calls with some of you guys, um, and the feedback we're getting really is a based around that. Economics. You know, we know MIPS are growing, your budgets aren't. How do we assist you in ensuring that we're utilizing and exploiting things that are of benefit to you and providing you capabilities to be able to use the efficiency of the environment and hopefully keep your budget at a static and, and static number, not necessarily increasing that. We all know that the, the CIO or whatever sees that mainframe line item, and it's a big number. 
You know, why is it that big number? Well, we also all know that the throughput and the cost of, in the end, is less for the mainframe. So we gotta make sure we retain that efficiency and, and allow you guys to be able to do more with less as possible. Business agility, continuous delivery. Um, very popular on web-based or app-based applications. Every week I get an update on Microsoft Outlook on my phone with some new bug fix, every week. That change affects you guys because those people on the application side are making those changes on a weekly basis. And we need to make sure that our environments are allowing you that same type of continuous delivery, but also retaining the service level for those specific applications as they make changes. So how do we actually allow you to add new services you know, and actually interact with the applications as they're making changes to ensure that you have the stability and the flexibility to move. Automation, man automation and management. We have staff, we have less staff than we did two years ago, we'll have less staff probably than we did in five years. How do we do the things we need to do from a perspective of introducing new people to the organization, but also automating the processes? We have organizations that have people that were 10 years ago, they had 10 people writing automation down to they have one person that's automation, if he gets hit by a bus, we're in trouble. How can we actually take that process, have the system start to learn from data that it's interpreting, interaction with the users, automation that may already be in place, and have the system start to understand when A happens and B happens and C usually happens, let's remediate C before, a, before it actually shuts down the system. So how can we actually learn from that? So security and compliance is the next element there. Continuous thing, how can we actually do um, and secure the environment we have there? There's some things that we're talking about, we have out, uh, out there, we've been talking about data content discovery. You know, if we can take a data content discovery and analyze the data that you guys have, understanding from a sample of the data, what has personal information in it, and we can tag that information, then as we turn on automation rules and deal with things that have those specific categories, we can have a better understanding of where that secured information is, how many copies of it we have, how many people have access to it, and specifically the location of where it's sitting. So how do we actually start to um, utilize some of that information that we have from a security purpose and take it into consideration of, up, uh, of um, operations? CPU jumps. Why is it jumping? There's a hundred denials of service um, things trying to attack the mainframe. Well, what do we do? There's a process, potentially automation to do that, but what do we need to do to get the security team involved to determine if it's a true threat or if it's something else that's occurring in the environment? I need a clicker. I need a keyboard that works too. So if we're looking at each one of these from the, the, the capabilities that we look at from economics, I mean, all these I think are pretty common themes for everybody, right? Reducing the MIPS costs, reducing your downtime labor software. Common themes for everyone here. The strategic focus of what we're doing. How do we do that? You know, exploitation of, of the, the environments we talked about. You know, single panes of glass. How can we standardize our user experience? You'll see out here a mainframe team center concept that we have, which is really taking some of the disciplines and starting to, pre, pre, uh, starting to present a common look and feel user experience so that I can share experience so when I'm actually filling in for someone that might be a storage expert and out on vacation, I actually have some knowledge of exactly what I'm looking at. How can we actually take that into account? You know, looking at our rationalization program. A lot of you guys being here with CA, have contracts with CA, rationalize to less vendors, makes more sense to deal with, less type of tools that you have to interact with, things that really um, we're looking actually to support. Keep hitting the wrong button. Velocity of innovation, we talk about that. You know, how do we actually do things with getting things to you faster, supporting you, getting things to the market faster, and really look at that life cycle of information that's happening and how we actually manage that mobile to mainframe. As I was referring to earlier, 
We know that applications change on a, on a weekly basis, okay? How many, I mean, you, everybody has updates on their iPhone, Samsung device, things happen. I have most of those right now on automated update. I don't even know they happen. You know, two o'clock in the morning, the phone wakes up, downloads, does the update. I'm comfortable with that. That's becoming an expectation of the environment that we're in, right? Is it, is it almost a continuous change in how do we manage that? How does our response time for a specific customer, if I'm making a request on an application, if it's greater than two seconds, I'm frustrated. So how do we ensure that as we're doing this agility, we can actually support that and continually take advantage of new technologies, take advantage of new efficiencies, and really look at how we can actually take advantage of different capabilities we have inside our offerings. Skills management, modernized tool sets. Um, when I say that, the first thing that people come to mind is UI. I had a vendor tell me, or not a vendor, a customer tell me a couple months ago, UIs are yesterday. I don't need UIs. I need automation. I need the system to understand what's going on and tell me that it did something after it's done it and it's taken care of the problem. So it does include, can we do some things around user interfaces because people do like visuals. But it's really taking it to that next step and really saying, how do we take analytics into this mix? How do we actually take the data, learn from that data, and have the system start to react to itself? Um, you know, that self-learning, self-building system is really what we're all striving for. Um, I know some of you customers in here have automated what I want to say the heck out of everything. But it's a continuous growth. Automation is never done. Because there's always something new that's introduced into the environment that is new to, to um, the process that we need to address. And then how can we simplify the architecture? You know, we've always done a lot of things from a perspective of installs, um, things that we roll out. And we're really looking at some of the new technologies. Um, the thing that we announced this morning from a perspective of um, mainframe operations intelligence, the operational um, analytics element of that is being delivered as a software appliance. So everything is contained, the operating system, the microservices, all of those things are inside of a pack, a software package that you just lay down on top of, on, on an IFL in this instance, which allows you to easily get that up and going without having to the, have the knowledge of a Linux environment. Customers have been asking for that. They need that, that ease of install and taking those new things and allow us flexibility to go in the direction that our customers want to go. Why do we look at putting on an IFL? Well, the goal was we want to take advantage of near processing capabilities, but also we built it in a way it's flexible so I can put it on an IFL, or I could put it on the x86 box, or I can actually run it on the GP if I want to, so that we have the flexibility of what our customers are, are going to be looking at. We don't know what the future is, but we want to make it flexible enough that we try to be able to adapt very quickly. Did you hear me get shot? So intelligent automation. We've always been, um, even in a lot of times, we have started, we started on the left-hand side, which is really something pops up on a monitor, I react to it. Something pops up five times, and I'm like, I'm not worried about that. It happens every Monday at 5 o'clock. It just turns red for some reason. So how do we take some of that you know, noise out of the mix? How do we start to take that and really start to build on top of that and really get to that path of where we're going? Anomaly detection has been a common theme, something we were introduced today um, as part of the operations intelligence element of really starting to look at data, the data we're feeding into it, and be able to start to predict and determine when things are out of norm. Gathering that data in a historical repository, being able to look back, and that leads us to the ability to actually do that pattern detection I was talking about and letting the system learn. The system learn from the data that's there, bringing data in and having API type technology, API type technology, APIs, that allow us to put whatever data we want to put into that analytic engine. Today we started with SysView, our systems data. Next up is our storage data. 
our network data. And we've done it in a way that it should be very simple, simple, to get that data there so that we can actually start to look at the interdependencies of those things that are going on. So we can actually take the knowledge that we have as an organization of the mainframe and actually make, that allow the system to make decisions out of the box on things that are occurring. And we get that, that takes us to the next thing is tying in Ops and VS or that automation element. Is as we interact and we start to learn from data, the other piece of that is actually learning from the user interaction or the automation that's there. So that we start, as we start to see patterns, we start to understand what the data means and how it's been remediated in the past so we can start to make recommendations. Some people aren't as comfortable yet. You know, I was a, in manufacturing, I was a production scheduler. Nobody could do production scheduling better than me. I'll tell you right now, nobody. At least that's what I thought. They tried to bring an automated system in, didn't feel comfortable with it. Fought it, fought it, fought it. I eventually went to work for that company. I went for work for another company that bought that company. Once I understood the technology and what it was doing, and it was really learning from me, taking the knowledge I had here, putting it into the system, it allowed me two things. Feel more comfortable with the system, automate a lot of things, and really kind of had the feeling that my legacy was being passed down because of the knowledge that I had gained had been passed on. So as we start to do things, as we look at this information and things pop up that are out of norm, maybe there's not an automation script. And I say, John, the last five times this thing popped up, these are the steps you took. Do you want to take these steps again? Yes, the system goes off and does those steps. John does that for five months. At the end of five months, John goes, I'm tired of this. Same recurring thing. I can't get the application guys to fix this thing. Anytime this issue occurs, John, you've done this eight times for eight months. You want to make this automation? Check mark. Yes, go off and create an automation script. Let me know when it, it triggers, just so I'm aware of it. But let the system start to learn from my interaction with the system. So the data's been telling me something. I told the system to go do something. Five times later, it says, John, you did this last time. You want to do it? Let's make it automation. So let's learn from the data and any interaction with the, with, the, with the users. We're hoping as that builds up, we start to see patterns that there's less and less of that personal inter inter interaction. There's always going to be that one obscure thing that's going to arise that someone's going to have to remediate. But in most instances, we can get the nuance or the newest nuisance, nuisance things out of the way. If I can get those nuisance things automated, I don't require an automation team to do that. I can then, as a subject matter expert that may be a Kix guy or a network guy, I can focus on the things that make the efficiencies that are most important for my environment. So I can focus on the right things. You know, reducing the cost, reducing those things, and making my system more efficient. Well, I mean, the whole, the whole basis of that is, is you're interacting with the tool. So when that, is, when that alert came up, at that point in time, we're going we're gonna to say, oh, John's going to address this alert. Boom, John did this. The, maybe it's a command. Let's take a third. Yeah, so with the tool was there, he, he, it was in context. So you got this alert. Oh, it's a kicks region. There's a problem. Boom, I can go that, do these commands, do these drop down select. We're going to be recording what he's doing. So the next time that issue arises and he remediates, John, this is what you did the last time. So it's recording that trail of information. That is, the tool, that is the point, yes. So a lot of this things is really trying to lift the burden from you guys. So a lot of, there's a lot of organizations that have taken and really taken tools that are out there, taken some in-house people, taken you know, domain expertise, and what we're trying to do is bring that to the thing. I'm sorry, what was the question? I, was in, I didn't hear you. 
Well, I mean, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the point, the next uh, use cases we're trying to figure out is what is, we, we can automate so many things and we have record of what that occurred, we can then go back and say, look, application guys, we can see that these, these efficiencies are happening because this is happening in your code. Um, the whole basis is we want to be able to do is if you tie in some of our other products, like some of our DevOps products, so we'll actually be able to see when the application act actually changed or an, a change was introduced into the environment. So we can say, hey, this happened on this day and this started to occur five times in a row. We have record of it. Now let's go back to the application guys and, and have that conversation with them. So now you have actually <laughs> some type of record instead of, yep. The, dev, the developers and say, yes. And, and you know, one of the use cases we have right now is, um, and, and I don't know if I have it in this deck or not, is, is that DevOps use case. Where a new application or an application change was introduced on a Saturday, if I had a static threshold type of approach, you know, and, and the theory that we had was, I might not see that till Monday. But if we're looking at some of this analytics dynamic stuff, we start to see that this thing's tr um, turning out a norm on Sunday I can then have the system automate some type of process of rollback or specifically start to say, send an alert, somebody go take a look at what's going on and make a decision 24 hours before it causes a specific problem. That's what we're, uh, we have the use cases in our queue. Let's just put it that way, Will. We have thought about that. Um, and, you know, it, as much as um, feedback as we guys have with you guys on a daily, on a weekly basis, let, we can have more conversation about that, but there's definitely things we're looking at currently. Um, so one of the things we're talking about here is, you know, how can we lift some of the burden? You know, um, from a domain expertise things, um, there's a lot of effort that, that some companies have gone into. So we really want to start bringing that information and be able to deliver this thing as an appliance for you. The appliance that we delivered with SysView is an entity as part of the license of SysView itself. So if you're a SysView guy, you get this. No additional charge. Because in reality, we want to learn from the information that you guys are having us, and plus it adds value to you. And it takes us to that next, that next level. As we add storage in, as we add those other pieces, it really starts to give that repository. This is built on an API environment, so I can take those type of things, instead of sending data to like a Splunk or something like that, all my data, I can get beat very uh, domain specific and only send the pieces that are very, very narrow and needed by those type of environments. Shocked again. So the whole ACE basis really is predict early, remediate, collaborate, and improve. It took me a second there, I lost my thought. We have, the, we have the capabilities of being able to look at data and see historically how things have been patterned. We can now today start to give you a path of where we see your green highway. Your green highway is based on what we're seeing from a historical purpose or perspective, we see that this is where you should be headed. The system can now start to see if we start to veer outside the lane and allow us to know that earlier. As we do that, that gives us the ability to see things earlier, remediate those things earlier, and as we take this to that next step, as we look at topology type level information and understanding the interdependencies, it gives me the capability to get to that lowest level offending element faster. There's some things out on the design zone, you guys, if you guys are interested in looking at that, Praveen is our um, key presenter on that, he was actually doing a session on that, of some of the next steps we want to take. You know, we've got a lot of data, we're showing green highways, what's that next step? Business service views. Okay, business service views and how we tie that into APM so we have a full enterprise view, but from a subject matter expert, how do I get down to a specific OSA card that may be causing a problem and identify that it's that OSA card that's tell, that, that, that is the problem that's causing this Kix region not to be able to access something or you know, as, as a use case. Collaborate. As we get data and, and start to be able to make feedback to the user, we can now start to be able to share responsibilities, whether that's an interface, whether that's you know, moving things upstream 
to someone that maybe not a subject matter expert, but actually can start to make some decisions, and then continuously learn. So as the system is, is, is feeding data, what are we learning and having the systems really start to understand? So operations intelligence um, release we did, you know, starts out as a at a systems level first, and we'll be growing into the other pieces that you see here. But it's really that ability to aggregate data into a central location, correlate what's happening so that A is happening in a kick series and B is happening in a network, and C is happening in storage, that that's not three alerts. That's one alert. And they just be, happen to be together and causing, the, causing those three alerts. Understanding how that's affecting the service that, the, that your, end, uh, your end user may be or the, the um, the business you may be uh, providing services to. Looking and understanding dependencies. A lot of times we have customers come in, they bring in new developers for applications that were on the, on the mainframe that are legacy, and they have no idea how those things, what they're touching or how they actually interact. If we can visualize that for them in some way um, that lets them understand their, their changes and how it affects that. And then really look at creating automation in real time. Now we understand from a production environment that may not be a viable thing because most people control that through some type of source control in some environment. But if we can start to do that and start to um, gather that information quickly, hopefully we can get more comfortable with that in a production environment, specifically it's an, if it's a critical downtime that we actually have to get the device back up and going quickly. And overall, what we're looking at from that is really looking across the different environments. As you can see, I'm not talking about products here. I'm talking about the different disciplines and how they fit together to really become that intelligent engine of data collection, automation, and really visualization. So as we talked about, we started with the systems environment. We now have built this intelligence engine as a central point. We'll be adding additional data elements into it over the next um, couple iterations of development. We're on a three-month development cycle, um, not necessarily a deliver sli delivery cycle. I didn't say that because people always get, I, I can't keep up with the three-month delivery cycle. But we start to introduce those other elements, storage, network. So we start to bring that information together to understand those dependencies. That's the key to that. We've always all had a lot of had tools. I know organizations in this room that use those tools, dump data into a central repository today for themselves and actually do automation off of that. Very similar concept, so we're trying to do that and adding the domain knowledge and take some of that burden off of, of, of the customer if at all possible. Whoops, with the wrong way, hit the wrong arrow. So some of the use cases we've been looking at, business service perspectives, I was really talking about this topology. Um, Praveen, like I said, if you want to step out, he can actually go through this in greater detail, but is really giving you that topology view, dynamically discovering the topology. We have the tools. We have some prototyping that's going on that we understand that this Kix region touched this DB2, that touched this OSA card, that touched this storage resource. We have that information. We can see that, presenting it working with you to allow you to, for us to say, we think it's this type of application, allowing you to actually qualify what that application is, but really start to understand and visually provide a, a, a mapping capability that allows me to quickly get to that lowest level, an element that's the offending element of what I was talking about before from an from a OSA card perspective. And be able to visualize that if we want, but in reality, just have the understanding so we can automate it on as many things as possible. In this instance, if you look at this topology, what we're really talking about is, you know, as the application enters the main, or as the, uh, the, the application initiates something into the mainframe, we can quickly follow down to what the offending element was here because we have an, anal uh, an analytic view of it and an alert view of it to really focus in quickly and then have our network operations center call the right person instead of necessarily going to a mainframe guy and saying, we got a problem and it kicks. When in reality, 
kicks was just a symptom of something that was going on in storage in this environment. So guided triage, kind of what I was referring to, some of the things that really starts to take that into a consideration is what I was talking about with John. You know, as we start to see that data coming back and understanding the information, how it's correlated, use machine learning to understand what's going on, how we're interacting with the system, and really start to provide people a direction of how they actually wanted to, how to actually remediate the problem uh, going forward. So, I'm going to have Greg kind of talk a little bit. Uh, so Greg works for Southwest Gas. Uh, he's based here in Las Vegas, so he came a long way to this conference. The good part is he gets to sleep in his own bed at night. Though he told me his significant other has a cold, so he's trying to stay away from that person, that, 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 one, that person right now, so he doesn't catch it. Um, but Greg has been a, a, an avid supporter of us for a long time and has been working with us uh, on some of the things that we delivered today. Uh, in our GA announcement, and we'll be continuing to work with us on some of the IT ops things. So I'm going to let Greg take a couple minutes of talking about some of the key items here, about you know what are the things that he's been facing from a challenge perspective, what's he seeing for the future, and kind of just let him present. And if you guys got any questions, feel free to ask Greg as well. So My name is Greg Payne from what's Southwest that? Gas. And, uh, oh, Greg, step out here so that, are you on the camera? OK, you may need to hold the microphone up a little bit closer. Anyway, uh, I've been in the industry, actually, this is my 35th anniversary this year. Um, surprised I've actually lasted this long, but uh, I still have fun doing it. Uh, some of my key challenges right now, and actually it's a lot, a lot of, like a lot of places, be it small, large, or whatever, uh, in many cases we're having to work with fewer people, fewer resources to work with, and so my biggest thing is just always looking for efficiencies, you know, better ways to do my job, Easier ways to it do is, my job, not, not whatever way stuff. can cut down the amount of time it takes me to either resolve a problem, work on a project, whatever it is, you know, is a challenge we all have. So us being a, a rather small shop compared to a lot of the other ones that I've worked for, um, you know, again, we still have those same challenges, um, you know, and even in the short time that I've been uh, with the company, which has actually been 10 years, uh, we've actually gone through some staff reductions, not because of uh, people just quitting. Actually, we've actually had a lot of retirements over, over these past 10 years, and we've just had to make do with uh, what we continue to do. So uh, I've actually had to pick up a lot of uh, additional responsibilities because of that, along with the other people still in the group. So again, you know, our time is very valuable and, you know, we don't have as much time to work on, a, on particular things. Um, so, you know, again, we always look for ways to, you know, what can we do to, you know, solve our problems quicker. Uh, I've been excited ever since I've been part of the uh, beta and sprint reviews for the SysQ product and this uh, operational intelligence, being the fact that, um, I'm hoping that ultimately it's going to make my easier, you know, my job easier um, with being able to help look for things that I can't necessarily see all the time. Um, a, couple of ca a couple of cases over, the pa uh, over recent times was, uh, I even spoke to JD about this one earlier, this is actually more storage related, but it's something uh, that hit us and actually affected production was a case where we had a storage group that was normally used for production. Uh, unbeknownst to me, who's one of the storage administrators, uh, one of my DBAs decided to do a production IMS image copy to um, a storage group used by Production Batch. Unfortunately, later that evening, I get a call. We have some jobs going down because it turns out there's not enough space in the storage group. So, you know, had something like this been in place, uh, I'm hoping that maybe it could have actually told me sooner and I could have reacted um, and we not had the outage. Um, another case actually that happened a, a further while back was uh, we had the case of, it was almost like a, a denial of service uh, attack 
but turns out actually uh, was uh, one of our own routers. Uh, at one time, we, the mainframe was the time server, was a primary time server for the enterprise. So all the devices were coming to the mainframe for time. Well, what we didn't know, a new router was implemented and um, unfortunately it was coming to get time every two seconds. Well, unfortunately, um, it ended up finally exhausting CSM storage, which is not a good thing. Ended up taking, well, ended up causing VTAM to ab end, and we actually ended up forced us to do an IPL. And because it was kind of a slow increase, nobody caught it. So again, this is one of these cases where, you know, we're pretty much static. Um, for a lot of the work we do because of the CICS online during the daytime and batch at night. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that, again, something like this would have uh, raised the flag sooner so that we could have done something. Uh, anyway, that's... Uh, cool. Like I said, that's, uh, those are some of the things that uh, we're hoping to get out of this. And, um, I'm hoping to continue to... Uh, do the work with CA to uh, expand these products. Greg, thank you. Um, I do. I do want to say thanks to Greg and and a lot of our customers. Um, we've been very fortunate over the last couple of months as we've been delving into the initial elements of this and having our our, our customers really engage with us, even providing data to us, um, so that we can actually double check our algorithms, double check the things that we're doing, and actually allowing us to play our data back to them or play th play their data back to them. And it's funny because as we've done that is, as they've looked at data over, over, um, over time, they've been able to say, and almost in every instance with each customer we've done this with, wow, if I would have known that was happening, I could have done something. Um, Seth Miller kind of alluded to that today from AIG. They had an MQ issue that he never even was aware of <laughs> during the time it was actually in production. He gave us that historical information. And as he was looking at it, he goes, Wow, he goes. I didn't. I didn't even know that 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 that, that actually occurred. So it was it was eye opening for us to to really say, hey, that's some good good vision of information that we're providing. But it also just really does a lot of uh, support of a lot of things we do with some of you guys in this room. Is you know, you guys make us better, and hopefully the things that we're doing are, are, are doing the same thing for you. So you know, as we really look at this, you know, a lot of this is just common. You know common steps here of things we're trying to do is leverage the data and, and the knowledge of, of what is happening in our, in our assets, you know, what is the different things that are happening at a lower level from flexible toolkits, really making sure that we are going away from things that we've done in the past and the way we've delivered things to ensure that we're allowing flexibility for growth in the future. Going from a reactive to proactive no touch, um, everybody has been striving that for, for a long time. Um, and we'll continue to strive for that. And really just, you know, continuous improvement. Looking at yourself, looking, let the environment look at itself, and just hopefully automate as many things as possible. I know as a personal uh, person that I hopefully try to do on a quarterly basis is just kind of reevaluate what's happened over the last quarter, personally or from my team, and just kind of say, okay, what could we have done better? And, and really look at that. And it's the same type of approach, um, really trying to allow that self-learning environment. Some of the things, the demos that are down there, the advanced analytics, you can go over to the performance area, kind of see some of the things, see that some of the things are coming from Ops MVS from a perspective of some new, um, some new user experience that's there. Look at the end-to-end -end with Cross Enterprise APM and how we're actually tying into the APM environment. Matt McLaughlin, who's in the back of the room, is, is heading that up. The Vantage and our storage pieces, how we're looking at some of the collaboration tools that are being used across the organization and that next step into the analytics piece and then really looking at the mainframe operations and really seeing some of the new pieces that we have there again with Michael Keel. Any questions guys? I have uh, starting to run out of time and oh yeah I forgot about the smart bar. So one of the things we tried to do and we did this last year, the things that you're actually seeing that we delivered this year we did as a concept, it was called design thinking last year. We have that downstairs. So what we've done is actually gone, go to the pedestals and you can see what we delivered. Go to the smart bar and you'll be able to see what are the things we're working on that are actually real code 
that's going to be coming soon here in the next in an iteration to, and then go to the design zone to kind of see what is the futuristic things we're thinking about. Some of the topology things that I was showing you are discussion points there, and some of the use cases, and give us feedback. You know, it's, there's no value of us delivering a product without your feedback and getting to the end and saying, here's a round circle, and then go, great, I got a square hole. What are you going to do? Um, so the more that we inter iterate, and, and Greg was talking about this earlier, the more interaction we have with you guys on a monthly basis, whether it's our sprint reviews, whatever, we get valuable feedback, whether it's negative or positive. I don't care. You know, you can tell me I'm a, I'm a jerk. I don't, you know, okay, great, I need to fix that. Okay? But we need to understand so that we don't waste time because nobody has that time anymore. Right? Nobody has time to wait. We don't have the people. So how do we make sure that we're getting the feedback, we're meeting the use cases that, we're, that you guys are doing with our user experience people and, and whatever and engaging with you guys. I know there's customers in here we meet with on a monthly basis. We go through issues, we go through um, enhancement requests, we look at a lot of those type of things. And I, you know, that's the same type of thing we're looking with the sprint reviews. Is, hey look, this is, what we've, this is the use case we're trying to, to, to accomplish. Here's what we've done in this last three weeks. Does that make sense? If you say yes, and confirm that, that's great. If you say no, then we have to take a step back. It's better to take a step back now than three iterations down when I gotta go back to iteration one. So, you know, it's imperative that we get that feedback. We've had probably, I think, in this in type of engagement, up to 80 customers, 80 different customers that have either been engaged in the thought process, the theory, or the physical actual testing use case. We've had customers that we just went and did um, user experience tests with. We put it up, we said, hey, do this step. I want you to go find this piece of information and just had a user person sit there and, and, and determine if the user experience is even intuitive. Because it, it, you know, we gotta make it simple. If we don't make it simple, there's no, then people just don't adopt it. So the more you guys can have, you take a look at the smart bar, what's, what, what's in uh, development, and then talk about the design zone and some of the vision things we're doing there. You know, the more feedback we get, the better. Some of the other sessions, what is today? Is today 16th? I've been here since Sunday. I haven't left, so I don't know if it's daylight or nighttime. Um, yeah, so these are, these are news. I, I'll leave this to Cindy. She, she's lined up these. These are the, the other systems that, were come, that we have going on. There's some things that are on the floor, uh, you know, making the data do the work, modern system intelligence. Um, you know, Arun and those type of guys are going to be talking about some of the things we have. If you want to talk about analytics and how we're doing things, you know, we have Namal down there at the smart bar that can really get into the detail of how we're looking at decluttering things coming forward, um, even talking about the lower level elements of, of how we actually use the different algorithms that we have of uh, looking at anomalies. So I hope this was informative. I hope I didn't bore you. At least nobody fell asleep. That's a good positive. I appreciate that. Um, if it would have been me, you would have heard me because i like a chainsaw, guys, like a chainsaw. Um, if you got any questions, I'll be on the floor the, the, tonight at the reception. We'll be on the floor all day tomorrow. Um, feel free to come. We can talk. If you guys want us to you know, follow up with some virtual t discussions, want us to come on site or anything like that, we're open to that as well. So um, we have a, a presentation that kind of goes into this, a little bit more detail of what the roadmap looks like and what's coming. Um, we can present and talk to you guys about. Um, more than happy to do that. All right, guys, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, like I said, if you've got any questions, reach out to me. All right, thanks, guys.